Welcome to the Needle's Eye Faith and Work Show, a show that aims to help Christian professionals grow in Christ, find your purpose, and transform your workplace. I'm Jeremy Woltz with Needle's Eye, and I'm sitting down with working men and women to find out how their faith impacts their work. Today, I'm joined by Jasmine Turner, journalist, news anchor, and public figure. Jasmine, hey! I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Um, honestly, it is. First off, I've just enjoyed like the few times you and I have gone to a neighbor in a couple of spots yeah. and gotten to know each other. Um, but it is such an honor just to have you come and join us in our very own kind of in-home studio that we're this trying out. This is so nice. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. Um, James demanded did an awesome job of getting this thing set it's up. It's beautiful. And you get to break it in. So I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing the end product. And just to give you a sense, mm -hmm. my hope today, like, I'm not going to try and get you to cry. I don't want to be like, okay, this is a failure unless I get like crazy emotion out of well. her. I really might just be want easy this. to make me cry, but that's okay. I mean, we'll see what know, happens. Tears don't hurt. <laughs> well, it's not my goal. Um, my hope is just you know we'll have a fun, like upbeat, casual conversation. Yeah. But it's really about you. Like I just want to get oh, to know more of your story about you know your walk with God, how He helped you become who you are. Yes. And then of course how that gets lived out at work. Cool. So you know, kind of a little bit of a journey that I we'll like be walking it. through. I like it. So I'm sure most people um, will recognize you. But can you do me a huge favor and just start by giving me like two sentences of a biography? Oh, um, you know, just like like the highlights, the super big highlights of just kind of you know who you are, what you do, and then here's a fun one I've I've really enjoyed asking people: What were you like as a kid? <laughs> How much time do you have? Um, okay, I can do it. My name is Jasmine Turner. And bio-wise, professionally, I am an anchor and mm -hmm. reporter for 12 on Your Side here in Richmond. Channel 12, I have been there for seven years. Wow. I'm from this area. I was born and raised in Henrico County. I am a wife. I am a bonus mom, a dog yep. mom, a daughter, my parents' only child. Aww. I am a friend, and though I have no biological siblings, a sister to many, mm -hmm. I just love community, I love people, I love God, and I just really believe deeply that um, I was put here to show compassion and to just hopefully spread a little bit of light. Yeah. Just here and there. You're doing okay so far. <laughs> yeah. So I hope that works. Yeah. So how about as a kid? What were okay, you like as okay, a kid? as a kid. So a lot of people don't believe this, but I was very shy. Really? Very shy, except for the people or with the people that I was most comfortable with. But that's like classic introvert, right? Yes. Like so, you're around your one or two close friends in yes. the life of the party, but you get into a big crowd. And you're yeah. but I was very, very, very shy. I was a bit of a crybaby. Okay. Um, <laughs> but then I started to grow out of that and then get really kind of into dance and performance and singing and all of the things. And I think there was one point in my childhood where I was super, super shy in the classroom. And that was always being put on my report cards that okay. I didn't talk. I didn't like to talk. In fact, there was a worry that I should be held back a grade because I not just, because of like your your yes great they said like at your the, social activity. yes I was socially not ready according to the teacher and my mother has always been my biggest advocate and cheerleader and she called the school and said I'm telling you you need to just test my daughter it has nothing to do with her academic yeah. abilities. She is very selective with who she talks to. Yeah. <laughs> she's, That's she's basically just what a she said. Yeah. Um, but I went from that to then getting on my report card talks too much. Okay. So, you know, once I came out of my was shell, like, it came out. Yeah, was there something that changed that? Was there like a summer you got your confidence? I mean, I have no idea. My parents would probably have better insight, okay, but I I don't really remember my shy days. Yeah. My parents do. But they okay. also remember teachers saying things. Like, wow, when I would get in the car because yeah. I'd be so quiet. And the moment I get in there with my grandparents or them, da 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 yeah. So I don't know. They're like, have you, are you sure this right, is the is right the same Jasmine? kid? Did you send this to the wrong class? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. That's awesome. So that's how I was. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> well, so we'll, we'll fast forward from childhood. 
And obviously now you've been doing, like you said, uh, 12 on your side for seven years. Yes. But your journalism didn't start there, right? No. It so, started really in college. Okay. I went to Elon University in Burlington, North Carolina. Go Phoenix. I love y'all. Everybody who knows me knows I love Elon. Okay. I really love Elon. That college was a really wonderful experience for me. That's awesome. But... Elon is just such a special place. Anyway, I could go on and on. But I went to Elon and they have an incredible journalism program. Okay. So my first year, I was able to start being a part of the student-run, student-led newscast at the time. Okay. So and I didn't have to wait. Like, were you covering like national news? Was that just no, like campus I, stuff? No, I covered a food truck. That was my okay. first ever story was about a food <laughs> truck. <laughs> On campus. Well, you know, now they have a brick and mortar building. You know, yeah, you really I helped mean, them. Yeah, I mean, right. I really sure. helped. No, but I, it's just little events here and there, small yeah. things. But I was able to really get into what would be my profession later yeah. on at just 18. I didn't have to wait to declare my major or anything like that. Did you know going in that you want, like, did you stumble into this or were you like, hey, I want to, I want to join the journalism team when I get there? When I was looking at schools, I knew I always wanted to do something in broadcast. So okay. like broad stroke broadcast, but the being a reporter anchor really came, I fell into that in college. Okay. But I will say my mother recently told me a story that when I was a little girl, I told her that I wanted to be Sabrina Squire or oh, like wow. Sabrina Squire, who is a legendary broadcaster mm -hmm. in Richmond when I was a little girl. Oh, that's awesome. So I, oh, the seed was planted, yeah. but you know, as you go on in life, you just kind of, you find different interests or you see yourself in different places realizing yeah. the seed was already already there and I'm, i might be getting mixed up but i feel like that's almost like you know you watch these college these uh sorry these football professionals and they're like oh my gosh i grew up watching tom brady and now i'm playing against him yeah <laughs> and that kind of happened with you and sabrina right like I, you grew up wanted to be like her and, then and you i got to work with her before her retirement wow. and what was it, that like incredible i mean she's just a wonderful person i recently talked to her on the phone about a story idea she's oh, just awesome. a great person and a consummate professional so i think the full circle really I'm very sentimental, so yeah. I never took for granted the fact that things that I spoke as a child that I didn't even remember. I yeah. remember watching her and always admiring her, but I don't remember saying that. So right. thanks, Mom, for the reminder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now it all makes sense. That's awesome. And now it makes it all even more special. Yeah. To okay. Me. So journalism, I have, I'll, I'll just admit, I am ignorant. <laughs> and so okay. I, like, I do, I, I think of journalism and I'm like, okay, well, I read spy novels, right? So it's like nitty gritty, <laughs> crime novel. fighting kind of sleuthing. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Or it's like <laughs> what you see on like, you know, fictional TV shows where it's like, oh, it's all glamour and glitz and these fancy big desks. And my guess is it's actually somewhere in between. So what are some of the realities of journalism that most people wouldn't see? It's not glamour and glitz. Yeah, okay. Whenever I speak to students, which is a big passion of mine, I tell them the hair, the makeup, the clothes is about 10%. Okay. And it's really kind of the last thing you think about. But it's the 10% that we see. Right. So we think that's all there is. Exactly. No, there is a lot of calling and emailing and researching and using social media as a tool for research to try to mm. find someone or... Story development, a lot of writing, a lot of rewriting. It's it's a lot more hair up in a bun, glasses on right. in the work. And then, I mean, I've had moments where I put my, I, I love wearing eyelashes, on like 30 seconds before because I've been working on something yeah. and that is my last thought. Yeah. You know, or I think one time I anchored something. This was like earlier in my time at 12 on your side. And I realized I hadn't filled in my eyebrows. Oh, well, like you just because you're so focused on right. getting the work done yeah. before anything else. And it's not like you have this like room where you go pamper yourself. And we have people... a makeup room that is beautiful and I love it, but we do our own makeup. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. you know, obviously I have a hairstylist who I love her and she does my braids. But in terms of every day. Right. It's on me to maintain. So it's not like Hollywood celebrity status. Yeah. Like it, it is much more down and dirty than we would probably guess. Absolutely. A How, lot more Maybelline and maybe drugstore cosmetics yeah, okay, than <laughs> fancy schmancy things. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. But I also think personally that's to me the 
almost the charm in it. Yeah. That it's a lot more down to earth than people may realize. Yeah. So. That's cool. So what got you interested? Because you, you said you, when you went to college, you already knew broadcast. Yes. Why? I mean, from being a potentially shy little child mm -hmm. if, that you don't remember being, right. but being a shy little <laughs> child to suddenly finding the stage and these performing arts and all the things you got involved in. But how did that leap to broadcast? So I have a wonderful village of family and I had parents who were working really hard, excelling in their careers. So I spent a lot of time with my grandparents after school okay. and the news was always on. Interesting. Okay always on and even with my parents getting me up getting me ready for the day mm -hmm. it was always channel 12 and then the today show oh wow and so the news was just always on and i think i just as a kid i just enjoyed watching it which yeah. is rare but i i liked watching the news as a kid but i also really liked the idea of what all goes into it mm -hmm. and what all goes into just broadcast in general. And I remember being probably a sophomore in high school <laughs> in a math class <laughs> and thinking to myself, I have to figure out a career path that requires None of not this. this. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be talking to people. I don't know what my future is, but I know it's not. Math. Yes. Yes. Basically. <laughs> but I just had this thought of, I, I want to be, with people and talking to people, whether that's producing things yeah. or the person that's interviewing or whatever it may be. And so I'm a big daydreamer. Mm -hmm. And I just remember having this very vivid daydream of a life that had me community facing that was broad, that yeah. included broadcasting. That's cool. And so it all fell together the way it seems like it should yeah, be. Yeah, <laughs> fell together. A lot of hard work yes, and determination. Yes, but you know what I mean. But yeah, I think it's absolutely. you go from a literal daydream of I need a career path that looks X, Y, Z to really living it and being in it is yeah. I'm very grateful every yeah. single day. One, I don't know this, but do you? is it common for somebody to be able to end up working in their hometown? I mean, is that... It depends. You kind of have to apply or do you kind of get offers? And... Everything depends on timing and opportunity and what's available. And, you know, we are in a business where you might see people for a couple of years and they move on to another mm. city or whatever their path may be. And so I always was worried that I'd never be able to work here because the people here were veterans and yeah. no one was ever leaving. And when would there ever be an opportunity for me right. and just a year and a half into my career itself? a weekend job opened up. Oh, that's awesome. And I've been here ever since. Yeah. I did not think, and I'll be transparent, I didn't think I'd be here this long. I never knew. You know, you just yeah. don't know what could happen. Somebody could send, send you an email on LinkedIn or, right. or or an email or call you and you just go to the next thing. Yeah. But it's, I have been blessed to just continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And it's not been very clear, like, okay, it's time. Yeah. It's time to move on. It's been, in fact, more so feels more like we're just going to keep rooting and rooting and rooting yep. Yep. <laughs> right here at home. That's awesome. That's It's got to be great to, you already had roots here. You already had a support system. Yes. And I'm assuming there's a level of, you know, self-esteem and image and all that gets tied into Sorry. a job that's so public facing. Yes. So to have that family and that support system Absolutely. and that network already in place, it's, that has to be huge. It's been, sometimes I don't even know how to describe it. And sometimes I have to remind myself to not take it for granted. Mm -hmm to be able to have my, it's not even about my family watching, it's that I can get off of the air and yeah. go to the family event. Yeah. Or I can have Thanksgiving lunch and then I have to work Thanksgiving night, but that's okay because I got to be with my immediate family. Right. Or to say, I'm volunteering at this event through my job. Hey, best friend, can you bring my um, godchildren so that yeah. they can come? You know, that's it's cool. just, it's amazing, but then the the even cooler part is to have that solid support system that was always there and then still be creating my own life here. Yeah. Right? Meeting people, making new friends yep. and and still expanding my just community and, and network, yeah. even though I'm from here. Right. I've I've relearned Richmond and I've been able to have almost a new 
life with my my old life. Yeah, that's really If cool. that makes sense. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, Jesus says, like, even a prophet doesn't have any honor in his own hometown yeah. sort of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, it can there's, be a, hard. there's a level of yes. like, oh, people watching knew me when I was like the awkward four-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> And that now didn't they talk take to me anybody but my mom. As I present the news. <laughs> right. So I, there's a level where it's like, oh, you've been able to kind of overcome that mm-hmm. and still establish yourself as a professional right. that's taken seriously and gets the benefits yeah. of the roots that you already had in place. And I give a lot of credit to my parents for always making sure I was in supportive environments. Yeah. And just, you know, I'll get messages or comments saying i worked with your mom back cool. in such and such and what a wonderful person she is i mean yeah. i i come from good people yeah. and so i think it really helps that that there is this sense of we want to watch you grow and root for you we're going to always remind you yep. that you were that little girl but it's in a loving it's in a loving way yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> so there's a good side to this right yes. which you described i have to know though as you've reported the news on your own hometown, mm-hmm. has there been any of like that sense of like, oh, man, I peeked behind the veil and Richmond is not the city I thought. Like, have there been moments where you've kind of seen something you go, this makes me think a little bit differently about the place I grew up? Absolutely. But I think it more so makes me say, I want, I want Richmond to grow and I mm-hmm. want, I want better or, you know, versus necessarily getting upset. I yeah. mean, I think I have had those moments, yes. I really can't think specifically, but I know that there have been moments where I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm committed to this place, mm-hmm. not just because it's my hometown, but because I live here again. Yeah. I, I want better. I want I want us to be better. I want, I want better for this place that I love. Yeah, that makes so sense. So I think I look at it that way. I think what a lot of people will find, I'm... I have this optimist lens mm-hmm. and I, as I've gotten older, I, I have committed to being more realistic with my optimism. Oh, that's almost sad. <laughs> like, I want but you to you just know be, like, I just mean, be but, happy all the time. But I think because the truth is you can't be, Yeah. but there is optimism even when things are looking a little. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I talk with my wife a lot about how like, you know, they, th- th- this is a joke. It's tongue in cheek. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm always like, you know, the key to life is low expectations. <laughs> because yeah, that's my husband if you're says. Too, if your <laughs> expectations are too high, you're always disappointed. Right. And there's a level of like, yeah, you, you want to hope for the best. You want to believe good things. Right. But there's also a sense that it's just a bit more realistic and practical mm-hmm. to say, I, I'll hope for it. But I'm also not going to be surprised if it falls a little short. Yes. That's, and that is me. Man- my husband always says, manage expectations there you go. versus that's, that's better. That's keeping a better them way. low. He yeah. says, just manage the expectation. That's smart. That's, <laughs> I'm going to start using that. Um, so let me ask you this, and this, this might be a hard question. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say in your still, I'd say fairly short career. Yeah, just eight years. What would you say has been your biggest contribution to your field in that time? Oh boy. I know, kind of a big one. Whoa. Oh, wow. Um, that's a hard question. Yeah, I know. I, you know, I, I'm really into the hard hitting journalism. Yeah, wow. Yeah, you said you didn't know anything about it, and then you just come <laughs> on. And I can't even say it's. It is. I will say this: I approach everything that I do, but really specifically my job, with a deep sense of empathy. Mm. And I think one of the biggest compliments and one of the things that means the most to me when I'm meeting people and I interview people. Um, I recently posted a, a reel on my, it was like one of the first reels where it took me a long time to edit it too, but I had found Editing a is the video. Worst. It is. I'd found a video from about 12 years ago when I tried to get an internship at channel 12. I saw, I, I saw yes. this. You were a baby. Yes, I a was. Baby. And I didn't get the internship, but then, you know, but life, God had other points. Yep. And someone commented, I will never forget, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but the compassion that you showed my family during like one of our worst times. Wow. And I think she also said, I don't know if you remember us. And I absolutely did. I mean, yeah. I, I remember a lot of people. And even if I don't remember your name, I remember your face and I'll remember your right. story. Just tell me your name and I'm going to remember it. But I think... I would say just 
I try to bring empathy and compassion because we people are trusting us in the worst days and the best days of their life. Yeah. And so to say I'm getting this trust from a complete stranger because the fact that you answered my Facebook message or my email or my yeah. phone call when I had to look you up on a website, <laughs> you know, to find your phone number yeah. and you invite me in your home and you invite me to maybe it's your church or your office, whatever it is mm. to I am tasked with helping share your story. Right. So I don't I don't know. I don't well, I but I, I think, think that's, that's good. When I hear comments like that, it makes me think, okay, you're on the right track right. because that is what I try to bring to everything. Yeah. Well, I think that's completely fair and, and a wonderful contribution because one of the things we, we try at Needles Out to talk with people in, in, in any industry, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be journalism, mm -hmm. right? But we talk a lot about how by nature of your job, whatever it is, you are given access to certain people. To their and whole the life. influence you have over them is profound. Yeah. And, you know, it could be financial advising where somebody, if they give you access to their finances, they're trusting you with everything, right? Yes. Finances are pretty, you keep it close to your chest, yes. right? And I think even with you, there's a sense that you have access to people in some of the, hopefully also some of the happiest, yes. but certainly some of the yeah. hardest moments in yes. life. And for you to be able to go in there and treat them with dignity and empathy. Mm -hmm. And I think most people are almost like, I don't wanna bring it up. I, I, I don't wanna make them talk about this. Right. And that's your job. Yeah. Your job is to make them talk about right. those things. Right. But to do it with respect and with tact and in a way that, that they walk away saying, she actually cares. Mm -hmm. I think that's a gift and that's definitely a contribution and something for us to say, Thank you. if we're living out our faith, yeah. it should color the way that we are interacting Absolutely. with clients or with people we're interviewing or whoever it is that our job is bringing us into contact right. with. And then what's the saying? People remember how you made them feel. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They, they may not even watch the story. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. Maybe whatever they went through is too hard for them to even watch the story. Mm -hmm. But if they remembered that the crew that came and put a microphone and a camera in their face was kind yeah. to me, that means more than anything. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, good. Okay. So we've got, we've got a fair amount of like background. We get yeah. a sense of who you are, the job <laughs> <Hopefully>. <laughs> side. I also want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, kind of how you got here, right? I mean, you've been doing this at, at NBC mm -hmm. for, you said seven and a half years, right? Seven. So seven years. And so I got into the business in general, the industry, whatever you want to say in June of 2015. So I graduated yeah. in May and eight days later, I was in Wilmington, North Carolina, Working a full time job, wow. living on my own. It's the dream. Clueless. Yeah. <laughs> didn't know. Clueless what you didn't and know. helpful. Yeah. yeah. And you said it was only a year and a half later that you got the yes. job at. Wow. Yes. That's awesome. So by October of 2016, okay. I reported on my final tropical storm, or I can't remember, a tropical storm or a hurricane in Wilmington. And wow. days later, I was here. And my first day on air, I did a story about a local sandwich shop that was closing oh. or moving and had been like a staple in the VCU area, Sally Bells. Oh, and, I remember Sally Bells. Um, yeah, that was my first day. It was in a meeting and someone said, do you want to shoot a story today? And I thought they were joking. Yeah. And then you look at their face and you realize they're not. I said, okay, I'm in. Oh, I think awesome. my exact words, because I was awkward and nervous, I said, put me in, coach. Yeah, you know? that's awesome. <laughs> and, and you look back now and you're like, oh, it's so embarrassing. Yeah, it was so cringy, <laughs> but yeah, I said it, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. So almost a full decade, right? Basically yeah. a full decade, just shy of, yes. you've been doing this. And it is a very public career. Absolutely. So where... <laughs> Where do, would you say, and, and maybe the answer is nowhere, and that's okay too, but where would you say like work Jasmine ends and, you know, personal Jasmine begins? Hmm. Probably work Jasmine ends. That's a, that's another hard question. You know, because it's, it's nuanced. A, right. There is your personal life and there's your work life. I think what's harder with this job is I can go to the grocery store. Right looking not my most glamorous just went for a run I, yes that's usually your, how a lot of people yeah. catch me it's like from a run that is so funny that you said that but that is a lot of times or hair in the bun a big pair of glasses on and like mismatched 
yeah. outfit and it's still, hey, Jasmine, Channel 12. And, you know, so there's that, which it doesn't bother me. Um, but I would say work Jasmine fully ends when I'm home. Yeah. And, you know, I'm I'm able to be like fully silly with my family mm. or, you know, just my husband and I have um, freestyle rap battles sometimes. Oh, that's awesome. you know? <laughs> I would love to see that. I, I'm not good. He is. But I think that's where it maybe ends. Yeah. Um, I think it is important to have a personal life and a professional life. Sure. You need that in life. You can't always be on. Right. It's just not realistic. Right. You but don't when have you're at it the in the grocery you. store and somebody uh, goes, oh, Jasmine, I know you from work. Kind yes. Of thing. You know, that like, maybe shoves you out of the personal space back into the professional yeah. space. Yeah. And I'm usually quick to say, hey, how are you? Yeah. And and I'm okay to have a conversation as long as you're cool with seeing me looking like this, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm human. I'm only human. Right. You know, we are all just making it day by day. Yeah. So. Well, and and I, we get the polished, professional, kind of perfect side of you oh, when we're no watching perfect. you on the news. Ooh. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you have this really great demeanor and you have this wonderful charisma and, and we see you and we go, oh my gosh, she just has her life together. Right. That's kind of the, the vibe. Right. Watching that we get. Right. I'm going to assume that being a human being, yes. there are still insecurities that you struggle with in your personal oh, life that bleed over into your professional life. Yeah. And again, I, I don't need you to be like, let me show you the skeletons in my closet. No, but I think the truth of the matter is, I think that's where grace is so important for mm. everyone. And just understanding, yes, I'm in a job that requires a certain level of performance and right. polish, but I'm not perfect. I stumble on air. I might say a word or trip over a word on live television, right. but I have learned to recover from it quickly or recover from it a certain way or realizing that what I have started to see is that people really do love to, to see that you are a human. And that yeah. doesn't mean they want to see your mistakes per se, but that you're just, you, I am no different than my neighbor. Right. I just happen to have this job mm -hmm. and that's, maybe a, a difference, but I'm not above anybody. I'm not more put together than anyone. Yeah. You know, I'm, I interview people. I'm like, wow, you are so put together. You know? <laughs> so I might have that reaction to another person who's uh -huh. just thinking, well, I, I, you're just interviewing me about banking, you know? But I think the biggest thing is, is I have to take off this perfection because the more that I focus on trying to be perfect, the mm -hmm. less real that I am. Yeah. And I really like how you said it that. It takes away the authenticity. So there, you can have authenticity and still have the, okay, the anchor, whatever. Mm -hmm. But more than anything, it's most important to just be a person. Yeah. To me. Yeah. I, you and I have talked in the past and I think we, we connected over the fact that we both have this, you know, if it, people know the Enneagram, like I'm a three on the Enneagram, yes. right? And part of being a three is there's a people pleaser side Absolutely. to life, right? And we, yes. we bonded a little bit over Ooh, that. Yes. And I think what's interesting is you know, I was in professional ministry. I guess I still am, but I was in pastoral ministry. Right. So a lot of time spent on stage and putting my life out there, not to the same degree as you. But, it's, but still. It's, it is very similar. But I think the, the approach that you're taking that I really appreciate and could learn from <laughs> is that, you know, when I did it, I, I felt like the person I was on stage, I had to be everywhere else. Yeah. And so I carried that with me. And it was like, I could never let my guard down. I could never let the performance end. Mm -hmm. And it feels like what you're saying, which by the way, was like a huge burden. And, you know, my poor wife always, always got the real it's me exhausting. and nobody else did. And, and unfortunately, when you're hiding the real you from everybody except your wife, your wife gets the worst of you, not the best of you kind right. of thing. So it took us a while to work through some of this. But with you, what you're describing, at least what it seems to me, is you really try to be your personal self even when you're doing the performance. Yes, yes. And so you, you are secure enough in your identity of who you really are that that goes into your work as opposed to being your work self when you go home. Yes, and I think that has – it is still an evolving journey, right? I am not going to be silly and <laughs> yeah. unprofessional on it. You're not going to break out into a random rap battle on but live I, hair. Right, but I might crack a joke or I want you to see my joy mm -hmm. or if there's an imperfection, lean in versus try to act like you're so perfect and yeah. above something not perfect happening to you. I think 
yes, being rooted, grounded, and settled in who you are, that it can all blend. Yeah. Yes, the person you see at the grocery store, at least appearance-wise, is not who's going to show up on the air at 4.30. Right. <laughs> but, but I think people get that. Yeah. But my hope always is that, yes, maybe the anchor voice is a little different right. than it is. Right me in the grocery store, but you're not gonna get this starkly different person yeah. if you meet me outside of the confines of the newsroom. Right. That maybe it's a more relaxed yeah. version of the person that you see versus two different people. Yeah, see, I, I like that. Yeah. I appreciate it. But that. that's a journey. Yeah. Because I don't, I, I'm, life is not a performance. At one point I literally had written on a mirror the performance stops now. Wow. And just reminding myself not to walk around being performative. Right. Because people can feel that. Yeah. They really can. How you're all oh, 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 on the news and then in yep. person you're maybe not nice or whatever it is or right. you're standoffish. I, I mean, that I can only speak for myself. Right. And I just know the path that I am committed to walking is one that is authentic. Yeah. Well, and to your point, you know, people can feel when you're being performative mm -hmm. and a recovering performative person. Here, yes. I can say that it was really limiting for me. Because you start to not know yourself. I don't know myself and yes. I don't let anyone else know me. Yes. And then there are moments where you go, I'm not sure I have like real friends mm -hmm. because I'm only giving them one minuscule side of me. I'm only giving them the performance version right. of me. And so in order to have that security, to have that identity, to know this is who I am and I'm going to be this person, not, not unapologetically in a jerky way of like, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm direct to so just deal with it. But in the sense <laughs> yeah. of, I know my worth, I know my value right? and I'm going to be who God has made me to be. Absolutely. Allows you to reveal more of who you are and take a risk yes. on developing meaningful relationships. Absolutely. But you have to let the performance stop here. Yes. I just, yeah, Once I love you that. Let that, um, you know, when I spoke at the influencer yeah. conference, I talked about being an Enneagram three, which has a lot of, like you said, people pleasing and high achieving mm -hmm. and wanting to just show more than feel Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes. And one of the things I found was on an Instagram account saying, you can take the achieving mask off yeah. and simply be who you are, which is a beloved child of God. Right. And so I have really committed to leaning into that. Yeah. Yes, I still have a job again that is high performance, you may one may say, but I can be a whole real person yeah. while also doing th Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, this is now just a recovering Enneagram 3 yes, podcast. Sorry. That's Welcome to for. our own. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I really, I, even just for me, that's hugely helpful. And I love getting your perspective. So thank you. You're welcome. I do have a couple of things I want to ask you about because clearly you have like a firm faith foundation. Yes. And I think a lot of that stems, you've talked a lot about your mom and your, your community that helped raise you mm -hmm. here in Richmond even. Yes. What role, or I guess, how is your faith a companion to you at work? Hmm. I have to trust God with every aspect of my life, or else I will be too worried yeah. to a point that I'm in shambles. Mm. And I, without trusting God, could see myself dealing with a lot more insecurities. Right. Because you're in a business where there is a lot of comparison yeah, and it is leaves a lot of room for, well, they have this and their career is here and they're doing this. What about me? What about me? When yeah. will it be my turn? Yeah. And I got to a point where instead of always running after what it, what it looked good for someone else, this matter of surrendering and trusting God I can go to church and lift my hands on Sunday. I trust you. But are you really trusting God with every aspect of your life? And one of the biggest being how you feed your family. Right. Like you're trying to be so in control of it. Yeah. And you're getting in your own way instead of stepping back and saying what one of the things I always say, what God has for me is for me. It mm. will not pass me by. And if it feels that it's past, maybe it, it's not for me and the next thing will come. Yeah. So 
that has been at least my work life is the same trust that I put in for my marriage or my family or my finances or my health. Mm -hmm. I have to put that same faith and action of, of trusting God with my career Yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Kind of more the idea that, okay, I, I'm not necessarily choosing my career path. Right. I'm trusting God to show me when it's time to go on to what's next. Exactly. And I'm going to be my best and do my best when I'm here. Right. But I'm open to him saying, okay, that exactly. season's done. Exactly. Exactly. Always being open to the possibilities that could come, but gratitude and trust that you're so, you're where you're supposed to be yeah. in the season, even if that season lasts a decade. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. I mean, because we think, okay, you put me here so I can experience my hometown and report here, and then off to the next thing because something bigger is going to happen. Yep. But what if your bigger is right, right where you are? Yeah. And that's what's been proven to me. Yeah. Time and time again. What would you say, if you could put this into you know fairly concise... What would you say is like the bigger picture of what you do? I mean, obviously you report the news, you investigate mm -hmm. stories and you bring them forth, uh, but it's you're accomplishing so much more than just saying, hey, this thing happened, moving on. It's informing people so that they can make decisions in their day-to-day -day life so that they can keep themselves safe mm -hmm. or that they can go double check that thing in their account to stop them from possibly getting hacked yeah. or going to look at that bill and then saying, hey, I'm actually owed X, Y, Z. It's providing people with information that will help, hopefully help their life in some way, yeah. their day-to-day -day life in some way. You know, yeah. you look at how important a meteorologist is because – it's more than just oh, is it going morning. right? Is it just going to rain, or what am I going to wear? But yeah. for some people, it impacts their career for the day. Yeah. If I am a landscaper, maybe I have to change my clientele for the day because it's going to rain, and right. I cannot go work on that yard X Y Z. So, I think the information, whether it's news, weather, traffic hopefully is helpful in some way yeah. to people. Yeah. Yeah. I've really, I appreciate that ability to look beyond like, yeah, okay. I got on there and I did a good job on my segment. Right, and that's no, the, it's informing but really people. recognizing, you know, this, this is a service that allows people to have the information they need. Yes. Hopefully to lead to better quality of life decisions for themselves. Exactly. I mean, something so, I mean, microcosm of all the things happening, but with the, Hyundai and Kia thefts, right. right? We are able to inform people, you can go get this steering wheel lock. Mm -hmm. Or did you know that you are possibly entitled to compensation in a class action lawsuit? Here's the website that you can go to. And when the money drops, here's the form to fill out so right. you can get money. Things like that. I mean, I think people don't always see it that way. Right. But that's how I see it and how we see it as well. Yeah. We want to provide you with information that can help you yeah. in some way. And when you can really kind of pinpoint, okay, there are people in this situation and I can see how this is going to benefit them directly as yes, individuals. as individuals. Yeah. And a lot of times, even when, because I work with the 12 on your side brand specifically of helping right. people solve a, a very specific problem for them, a lot of times it also can help someone else as yeah. well. We'll do a story on a specific person and then get four emails saying, that also happened to me. Yeah. I'm going to try XYZ solution as well. Or I saw your story, but I caught the tail end. Any more information you could provide me? It, I find the most reward in that aspect yeah. because my mom loves to say, I saw on the news <laughs> and I laugh because I said, which which hour did you watch? Yeah. Was it me who told you? That? Right, right. <laughs> but you realize there are a lot of people, whether it's just the app or social media, it's not always watching, right. but they get the information and they use it and go about their way. Yeah. I know, because we've talked previously, that journalism was not the only thing you thought about. Mm, but yeah. there was a time, and I might be a little bit off, but there was a time <laughs> where you had thought about maybe even pursuing ministry, right? Yes, as a so, teenager. Okay, as a teenager. And I know you were super involved in like gospel choirs yes. and, and kind of the musical side of, yes. of ministry in a lot of ways. Can you talk me through a little bit of, you know, why were you diverted from that path? Mm. And then also, where do you see God working through you even still in your job today? It's not ministry per se, yeah. 
but God's still at work through you. So, I'll answer it in reverse. So okay. where I see God working now is the aspect of helping people hmm. as an on your side investigator, really helping people from reimbursements to one of the stories I love the most is helping a woman get a new smile because oh. lymphoma had caused um, her teeth to decay due to the radiation. And oh, for wow. a year we followed her journey of getting a brand new smile for free, thanks to mainly free um, yeah. at a very reduced cost. Um, wow thanks to a dentist and some oral surgeons and basically a team of folks right here in Richmond. And I've always loved the scripture of being the hands and feet yeah. of Christ. Um, and so I just, I just wanna help somebody. In my l actual bio on the website for the station, it says that I strive to live by the words of a song. If I could help somebody as I pass along, then my living will not be in vain. Yeah, And so, that that's how in my work aspect. And right. then um, just growing up, I just, I was a church kid. Yeah. I, I mean, it's like, I was such a church kid. My community, my, my three of my closest, best girlfriends who I call my sisters, we talk every day. We all became friends through the church. Our two of us, uh, three of us, our parents were raised in the church together and then they raised us together. And, I just always found a deep connection and community and in, in church yeah. growing up. And so from there, I kind of took on some more leadership roles within the denomination that I grew up in, which was American Baptist. And I had a lot of great mentors, uh -huh. strong leading women in yeah. American Baptist women's ministry specifically. And I had folks say, have you, have you thought about pursuing it? Right. Like, I don't know about it. You know, I sing at church, I dance at church, I teach vacation Bible school, but I don't know what that would look like as a career per right. se. And so my senior project in high school, at the time you could do three weeks of drop shadow or kind of pick something. And I chose to write a devotional book. Oh. And writing devotionals and part of my project, I taught some Bible studies. And I thought, oh, okay, the writing and teaching, I like that yeah. aspect. So maybe I'll go to Divinity after college. Okay. Is that book publishable? Can we get your devotional book? I'll get you a copy. Okay, great. <laughs> it's just funny to read like 17 year old mind oh, versus 30 year old who's actually been through some things right. and seen some real life. <laughs> Not saying that I hadn't at the time, but I really hadn't. And so I'm pretty sure like in the bio of that book, it said that that was at the time my goal, even though I always loved, I mean, I still loved broadcast, but right. I always kind of wanted to do both. I, don't, I never really thought that fully, that full picture out. Yeah. Like I knew I wanted to, major in broadcasting, but somehow like get a master's in divinity was sure. like in my brain at the time. Um, I don't really know what diverted, if there was kind of a specific diversion. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I really fell in love with just the broadcast career itself. Yeah. And I could always still be a part of ministry in some way, whether that was being a part of a church or I think sometimes we look at ministry, it doesn't have to be anything big it could just be mentoring one person yeah that's still ministry absolutely and ministry also doesn't necessarily have to just be church there's ministry in that's why you guys do what you do here yeah, thankfully uh, right <laughs> we exist because of that yeah. i mean i think reimagining what does what is what is ministry yeah and so i, I just i don't remember a specific moment I just know I kind of said, well, I will, that relationship still exists with God and I will find faith communities as I move along in life. Yeah. And so I've, I've done that, but you never know what could happen in the future. I don't know. I don't foresee myself like pastoring a congregation. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, you know, also, but, yeah, you never know what God I mean, will do. I mean, but I love, you know, speaking to women's groups and conferences mm -hmm. and sharing my faith story and, and just encouraging people and being in these safe spaces of, yeah. of faith. That's awesome. I think that's more of my personal ministry than anything else. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's not that you diverted away from it. You've just kind of enmeshed it. Into yeah, what enmeshed you're it doing. and reimagined it. Yeah, I think at the time, that was 2011. I think at the time, it, minist- going into ministry looked like getting a degree, right. and then going on because I specifically wanted to work in youth ministry. Right. So I think I was like, I could do this by day, and then like on the weekends be a youth pastor. I just never really thought it out fully. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think it's because God was like this is the plan you're making right? and it doesn't even really make sense. So right. just keep following me. You'll be all right. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. All right. Last two questions. Okay. Uh, we've talked so much about like journalism and what you do with mm-hmm. your job and all that. But I also know that you are one of the single busiest people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and like you do it to yourself. It's not like Absolutely. your job makes I, you busy, but like I you teach chair caught. yoga on random Thursdays <laughs> yeah. and you just do so many kind of extracurricular things yes. that are not a part of your job. Yes. And let me tell you, I'm an extrovert and I'm energetic and I love people. Yes. But when I get home from work, I'm like, I'm going to sit on the couch mm-hmm. for a minute. I need to collect myself. If I sit, I'm not going back out. Yes. You are not that. You are like the opposite. You're like, okay, cool. I'm going to go like run a half marathon randomly <laughs> and just doing all these things. But most of them are in some capacity serving others. Yes. So what motivates you or compels you yeah. to keep yourself so busy in that way? Well, I will say, maybe this is the exclusive, I am entering into a season of pulling back. Okay. And I've committed to that. Um, I've started saying no to things. Is that hard? Yes and no. Okay. I think that I'm having to really sit with myself and say, the service can still be done. Mm -hmm. The loving on people and the being in the community can be done, but it doesn't have to be done in a way where you're your calendar is so loaded that for two days after everything ends, you're trying to recover. Yeah. And so I've had to really get quiet and reimagine things. Yeah. And also just get a little more real with myself of you are not 22 anymore uh-huh. <laughs> and your energy levels are. Yeah, you don't bounce back as quickly right, as you used to. Exactly. Yeah. So I will say, I am moving into a space of of just being more realistic with my calendar. Mm -hmm. And even like today, I said, oh, I'll go to the gym and then I'll go do the podcast and then I'll go to work. And I woke up and I said, have a slow morning. There you go. Take your time. Look up a new podcast and just listen and maybe catch up with that person who um, you've been meaning to call this week. Yeah, I've been trying really hard. I'm just, I guess, wired to just like, energize or bunny yeah. energy, but it's really okay to just slow the drum beat down. Yeah. And I, I'm giving myself permission as I move into 2024 to slow it down. Yeah. Now, people are gonna say, you're still gonna be busy. I'm not saying I'm not gonna be busy, but I'm really trying so hard to commit to if I know on a day, because I've started to get emails of, hey, could you do this thing yep. in March and this thing in April? And the, and making sure that if I say yes to that thing in March, that's the only thing I'm doing that day wow, outside yeah. of working. If, yeah. if it falls on a day I work, or if it's a Saturday event and maybe I get asked, so I do also love the health and wellness space. So I teach yoga and, um, I have been asked to get back into teaching cycling and I've had to say to myself, if I do that, I would only do it on a basis where I sub versus taking a regular class again and saying, okay, if I know that I have a class on a Saturday morning that I'm committed to teach and someone's asking me to do something on Saturday afternoon, do I say, hey, could someone sub for me for the class or right instead of saying I'm going to do everything in the day? Yeah. I said, you don't, I don't. It's not serving me nor the people I hope to serve right. if I'm coming in on fumes. Yeah. Because I I know that all too well and I know when I'm on fumes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Versus my the best version of who I am. Yeah. 
I want to come back in like a year. And okay, say, okay, Jasmine, we're committing to it today. How did it go? Yeah. Like, what, what did you learn? <laughs> did you actually yes. give yourself that space? Like, I, I can't wait to come back and see how your life has shifted yeah. from taking that intentional and break. And I'm excited. I'm excited for it because I think it will give space for some of the things that I've not been able to give time to in my personal life. Right. Because I have to do three things, four things, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll read more books this year coming up because I just am taking more time or doing some things that I miss out on that yeah. I've wanted to because my calendar is so full. Yeah. And again, I love to say yes because a lot of times I just love to do all the things, but I, you don't, I shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm starting to realize. Like I don't need to and more yeah. than anything I shouldn't. Yeah. And I think there's a side you, you, I grew up in the church, you grew up in yes. the church. There's a side of, you know, there's a people pleasing nature in us. There's a little bit of the fear of missing out. Then there's also the side for me. I won't speak for you, but for me, where I felt like what it meant to be a good servant to was to run yourself ragged. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say yes to everything because that's what God wants for me. And even if I'm exhausted, that's the sacrifice mm -hmm. I make. And I'll have nothing left when I get home. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I left it all in the service of the Lord. And that sounds really kind of righteous and holy. And there are times where that may be appropriate. But I can't in all of my time spent in relationship with the Lord believe that that is what he wants for us perpetually. No, I he mean, wants us to have times of rest yes. and to let us recover. Because when we rest, we can actually serve him with our best. Absolutely, one of my most beloved, favorite elders in our church said, "We labor to rest." Yeah, and that that you have to rest, and that was the thing she kept saying: "You have to rest." Yeah, like it's holy. Your rest is holy. Your rest is sacred. And um, one of the things we've been saying at home a lot is there's also a holiness in your no. Yeah. Because your no could be someone else's yes. Your no could be yes to rest for yourself that is needed so that the next thing that you do is done with so much excellence because your cup is full. Yeah. Versus you are just showing up because you committed to it. I want to show up in spaces wholeheartedly. Yeah. And I cannot do that if I am too tired. Yeah. So yeah. I am trying. It might be a journey and I'm probably going to catch myself a lot of times looking at the calendar and overlapping and then having to really say, I can't. Yeah. And I'm so sorry. Yeah. But it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It will. And people are a lot more understanding. Yes then we give them credit for. Uh -huh. It's more a fear of ourselves than fear of people's reaction to our no, I think, yeah. at, at least for me. I think it's a fear of, I wanna prove to myself I can do everything in a yeah. day versus, oh, I'm letting them down by saying no. Because the reality is if you say, no, I can't MC this event or I can't make it, They've got a couple other people that yeah. they can go. <laughs> They'll go to the next person on the list and say, well, maybe they can. It's like, maybe they yeah. can. And maybe that person has been wanting the opportunity right. and nobody had asked them until now. You just don't know. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of wisdom in everything you just shared. Thanks. <laughs> Last question. And hopefully this was a little bit easier. Yes. But at this stage in your life, with everything you've got going on, where do you find your joy? Oh, honestly, in this day and age and stage of my life, I find my joy in just taking a breath every day mm. in every moment of the day. Yeah. I think especially the last couple of years, COVID and, and everything that we've seen, like the joy of a deep breath is really powerful Yeah, to me. Yeah. Um, what does that look like, a deep breath for you? I think sometimes it's just sitting where you are so literally, yeah, a literal deep breath. Yeah, a literal. I mean, because then you're reminded of the breath in your body from God that like you have a new opportunity every single day Yeah, to have joy because there is breath in your body. Yeah. I don't know. That's probably like ultra deep, but. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, but that's, you know. I just realized that. I it's just, a word. I'm so, that's, that's a word. Amen. Um, yeah. I just thank God for every breath. Yeah. There's joy in that. 
because yeah. that means that I can be here for my family. Mm. I can be here for my community and I can be here. <laughs> yeah. I can I'm just here. Be <laughs> I'm here. here. Yeah, yeah. Cause that like God has brought me, I woke up this morning. There's joy in that. Yeah. It, That's it, awesome. To me, it's just so simple, mm -hmm. but I've started to, to just realize that. And yeah. sometimes like we are at home, we'll be like, thank you, God, for this, a roof, this roof over our head. Yeah. And it's not like, oh, thanks for this house. It's just like, thank you for provision. Yeah. Thank you for being healthy. <laughs> yeah. It's just, sim I'm just trying, the joy is in the simplicity. I love that. For me. Yeah. At this point. That's awesome. So. Well, good. Well, let's take a deep breath. Just one big. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to the Needle's Eye Faith and Work Show. Please share, like, and subscribe if you enjoyed this episode and want to see more. Needle's Eye is a faith and work community based in Richmond, Virginia. We are a nonprofit organization that seeks to help working people grow in Christ, find purpose, and transform the marketplace. Check out Needle's Eye online at www.needleseye.org. Here, you can find more content, check out upcoming in-person events, and learn more about partnering with us financially.